What if your doctor had knowing evidence that something didn't work in terms of, let's say, a cancer therapy? Something that had knowing evidence of something that did not work, but told you to believe in something because he wanted you to heal. Hello and welcome to the Consistency Project Podcast. My name is Patrick Cummings. As always, I'm here with E.C. Sinkowski. Every week on the show, we aim to simplify the science of nutrition, health, and fitness, cutting through the noise to focus on the principles and practices that'll help you perform better, feel better, and live better. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. Hello, E.C. What's going on? Not much. How are you doing? I'm wondrous. I'm excited to get into this convo with you. (laughs) We are going to uh, spend some time talking about sleep supplementation. And then we'll wrap the episode up with a quick bite uh, from a listener about how to talk to or your advice uh, to her about talking to kids about nutrition. Cool? Yeah, let's do it. Let's get into the fun bits. All right. So uh, this is one of those. I feel like we should just get a just a zoom out. What do we need to know (laughs) about about supplementation, about sleep supplementation uh, so we can get into this conversation? Yeah, this is actually kind of a follow up to a couple of episodes. So about a month ago, we talked about diet and sleep quality. And then last week was this discussion that I had with Pat Sherwood and Adrian Bosman of the Very Not Random podcast about supplements generally. And I think those really help set the backdrop for being able to touch on some sleep supplements that have been in my queue for quite some time. (laughs) Now, we're going to talk about some of the scientific evidence as related to these supplements individually, but I do think setting the backdrop, especially with last week's podcast with Pat and Adrian, have some good facts that are just helpful to remember about supplements generally. Those include the fact that in 2021, the U.S. supplement market was $50 billion with $900 million spent in marketing. So, you know, we hear follow the money all the time, but it seems like people sometimes um, don't follow the money when an influencer that they like (laughs) provides their supplement codes or something like that. There is a ton of money in supplements. Um, Another thing to remember, as of 1994, supplements became regulated like a food, not a drug. And so supplements don't have to demonstrate purity or even efficacy before going to market. And so this is where we have these issues where supplements might not very often do not contain the dose that's listed on their label. And then we have contamination, contamination issues where the supplement contains things that you don't think are in there. They're not on the label, but yet they're in your supplement. Oh, and supplements don't have to demonstrate efficacy. What do I mean by that? So the supplement might say on the side, like this supports brain health, which sounds great, but also somewhere on that label, they've gotten the fine print quote, these statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. And so supplements are able to make these claims that have not been validated in the scientific literature or by a governmental agency. And so you might think that you have a good supplement based on the brand or the price or because so-and-so said so. But first of all, if it's not verified by a company like USP or NSF, there's very likely the concentrations are not what you think and it's contaminated. And neither of those companies will actually be able to prove that it does what you think it does. <laughs> they don't actually prove the claims. So I just want to remind people of all of these issues surrounding supplements before we sort of get into each individual one and what the research says about that. Take it. Okay. So uh, in the episode that you were, you referenced the sleep and diet one we did about a month ago, I remember we talked a, a fair amount on the complexity of actually just measuring sleep. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so is that also an issue here I mean, I imagine it is when looking at sleep supplements. Totally. Right. I mean, if it was only so easy to measure oh, how long I was asleep, it, it's not. Um, yeah. Measuring sleep in the sense, especially of, is this relevant to the outcomes we want in terms of weight, health, and fitness is not really cut and dry. And so these studies, just like they would for just um, looking at health or diet quality, in terms of supplements, we're also going to have studies look at various measures of quantity and quality. And so I just want to touch on some of them because they're going to come up when we look at these supplements. You know, sleep quantity. Okay, great. That's how many hours we spend asleep. Some of the more common quality measurements include that sleep onset latency, how long it takes you to fall asleep. 10 to 20 minutes is a good healthy guideline. Sleep efficiency, how many of the hours that you spent in bed were you actually sleeping? 
85% or higher is a good measure of sleep efficiency or a healthy measure of sleep efficiency. And then there's this popular questionnaire, the PSQI, the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. It's 19 questions that the person self-reports gets a weighted score out of zero to 21. And um, if you have a higher than a five, it indicates some sleep disturbance. But that then is going to be um, influenced by the individual's perception of sleep. And that's that's what gets really interesting about this. There's, there's other measures of quality, but those are the ones that I want to highlight right now. And, you know, again, we have to remember, especially once we get into supplement and supplement claims, that something on paper could change but that might not change my, I don't know, functionality for lack of better word, that maybe a supplement does decrease my sleep latency by five minutes. (laughs) So, you know, studies show that this supplement improves sleep quality, but what does that really mean in terms of my weight, health, or fitness? Probably nothing. And so we have to be aware of all of these different measures of sleep quality that might be coming into play, as well as, is this really relevant to an outcome that I am interested in? Got it. Okay. So I think we're going to get into a handful of supplements, but we can't start without starting with the big one, which is melatonin, which is probably the one that most normal people have uh, certainly heard of, if not tried. Um, So let's start there. What do we know? What do we think about melatonin? Yeah. Yeah. Probably, like you said, the most common uh, sleep supplement. Melatonin is that brain hormone. It responds to darkness. It helps us set that circadian rhythm, you know, processes that happen on these 24 hour clock cycles. Um, And supplementation doesn't seem to be that helpful to improve sleep. So there's a 2013 meta-analysis of melatonin for sleep disorders, which includes insomnia, but other things like narcolepsy and obstructive sleep apnea. But it's looking at 19 studies. It's got about 1600 subjects. And it demonstrates that melatonin decreases sleep onset latency and increases total sleep time and improves overall sleep quality. Which, if I were just to read that sentence, as I did, it sounds super promising. But that's when you then have to look at, okay, how much are we talking about? Because when you look at the magnitude of the changes relative to sleep latency, it reduces my sleep latency by seven minutes. <laughs> it increases my total sleep time by eight minutes. <laughs> <Ruh-roh>. <laughs> right, right? Like, so this is where, again, I just want to highlight that a supplement company, even very ethically and honestly, could say something like studies show melatonin improves sleep. And yes, technically, st- statistically significant, it does. But does increasing my sleep time by eight minutes do actually anything for me in my life? No. I found also two more recent reviews from 2022. They're the Low and the Fatima papers in the show notes, both looking at um, about 20 to 30 randomized control trials each. They both found that melatonin improves sleep quality. This one they measured by that PSQI, that self-reported questionnaire that people look like uh, people take about their sleep. Now, what they found though is that the measurement on the questionnaire improved by about one point. And if you recall, I said that it's on a scale from zero to 21 and above a five is a problem, right? So this is another example where, okay, great. So it found that it improved your questionnaire rating by about a point. But what if that's moving me from a nine down to an eight? Like I'm still in the problematic area, right? So it's questionable of how significant this decrease is. And so the Givler 2023 paper in the show notes, I think summarizes it quite well. Quote, the effectiveness of melatonin in initiating sleep is measurable, but small in most people. And so what I find is that when we look at organizations like the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, the American College of Physicians, they just say that there's not enough strong evidence to recommend melatonin use for chronic insomnia. And one of the things that I also wanted to bring up about melatonin, because it's quite a popular concern that people have specifically about melatonin, you know, it's a naturally occurring hormone. And so people are concerned that when they take it, it could potentially downregulate their natural production. Meaning once you start taking it, you might not be producing any more naturally. And so you're kind of stuck taking the supplement forever. I will say that there's not evidence of that in the literature. In fact, there's a crazy case study. I couldn't even believe it. They gave an individual 50 milligrams of melatonin a night for 37 days. For reference, one milligram knocks me out. (laughs) 
Like I'd prefer half a milligram when I take it because otherwise I'm way too groggy and normal doses are like one to five milligrams. They gave this individual 50 milligrams a night for 37 days and it did not impact their melatonin production. Now that's a case study. So some other studies have been done as well, but it doesn't look to be like that's a problem. But that being said, I don't really think there's much evidence to suggest that it's really going to improve your sleep quality. The one other thing, and I just want to highlight this because I came across this study, which was so interesting. It's the Erland um, paper in the show notes talking about melatonin purity. They took 31 melatonin supplements from grocery stores in Canada and tested them for, okay, it says this much melatonin on the label. How much is actually in the product? (laughs) Melatonin content was found to range from minus 83% to plus 478% of the labeled content. So it could be upwards of four times of what you think you're taking. And then even this, there was variation between, let's say, bottles of the same product by as much as 465%. So even the same brand had four times level of changes of concentration between different lots. I mean, talk about the Wild West. Supplements are the Wild West. As you just say on the label, some melatonin. <laughs> we think, oh, it was also <laughs> contaminated with uh, serotonin. But, you know, it's just like, yeah, it's the label should be something like, we don't really know. <laughs> We'd like Hilarious. it to contain melatonin. You tell us. <laughs> We're doing our best over here. That's what it should say. We're trying. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So the rest of the supplements that we wanted to hit on, that you wanted to hit on, uh, came from actually from a request uh, from somebody on your email list. Uh, and that is for, specifically, it's for Andrew Huberman's sleep stack, which includes five different things. I'll list the five, and then I think we're just going hit to hit each one of these bullet points. Uh, and this is, again, uh, Andrew Huberman, who's this kind of wildly popular uh, podcaster, scientist, influencer. Um, 145 milligrams of magnesium threonate or 200 milligrams of magnesium bisglycinate, I think. (laughs) Bisglycinate. Good job. 50 milligrams of apigenin, 100 to 400 milligrams of theanine. And then every three to four nights a week, he adds two grams of glycine and 100 milligrams of GABA, G-A-B-A. You have to tell us what that is. Um, so why don't we look at each one, but, uh, maybe before we get into each one, just like Big picture, there's there's what one, two, three, four. Uh, thoughts on it, big picture. Yeah, I mean, maybe after this sentence, some people will choose to turn off the podcast because I would say there's no evidence that these are optimal doses. There's no evidence that this is an optimal, optimal mixture of supplements. And the evidence that these actually help with sleep, either individually or, or in combination, is weak at best. Um, what's really unfortunate is I c- did not find where Huberman has the evidence to recommend these. Um, so I did find this list on his toolkit for sleep webpage. Um, that webpage, from what I saw, had, didn't have a single reference. Um, thankfully, in the text, he does mention that not everyone needs supplements and not everyone needs all of these supplements. But my expectation for somebody with his pedigree would be that there would be some references, which Again, you might say as an oversight on this page, but he did remember to link to his supplement sponsor, Momentus, on that page. So my opinion stands. Um, I did want to spend a little more time trying to figure out where he has the evidence for this stuff because I'd love to know, okay, am I missing these various studies that say all this stuff? So I did poke around a little bit. I found his 2023 solo episode titled Developing a Rational Approach to Supplementation for Health and Performance. He does talk about some of the sleep stack there. I saw only one reference for the whole episode and it was not on the sleep stack. I also found the Perfect Your Sleep episode. It had three episodes, uh, three references for that episode, but none were specific to the sleep stack. So I did not go through all of the podcast episodes, but, you know, for somebody who is kind of known for their science, number one podcast in health and fitness, I think this is a, a massive oversight if he does have references that he's not citing to. And I just also have to point out that these episodes are sponsored by Momentus, the supplement company, Element, the electrolyte supplement, and AG1, or Athletic Greens, the powdered green supplement. And so it's great that he's upfront, I guess, about the conflicts of interest here, but it's a little bit hard to be like, guys, yeah, he's going to recommend some supplements, right? So I you know, want to be clear that it was very hard, i.e. impossible, to find uh, references that really support these claims from where I see that he you know, recommends them or the sources where he recommends them. Got it. Okay. Let's start with the, uh, the top of the list, the magnesium portion of this. Um, as you're, as you mentioned, not, doesn't seem like there's a lot of evidence, but what's the claim? And far as you can tell, what does the science, what does the evidence, what does the research say? Yeah. 
So from what I understand, he recommends magnesium 3 and 8 or magnesium bisglycinate um, as the specific forms for helping to sleep because they will pass the blood brain barrier and that they really help the person fall asleep. In other words, reducing that sleep latency um, kind of because they produce this mild form of drowsiness. Now, I don't really find that in the evidence. I did find this MA 2021 paper in the show notes. It's a meta-analysis combining the results of um, three randomized controlled trials for magnesium supplementation and insomnia. They did find magnesium supplementation helped reduce sleep latency. So, so far so good by 17 minutes. So, okay, this might be the evidence. But the problem is these studies used a different form of magnesium. They use magnesium oxide, which specifically Huberman does not recommend. So I don't think this is what he could be referencing. And I will also say that this study says that the three studies they look at are, quote, supported by low to very low quality of evidence, and that the clinical significance of the change in sleep latency is debatable because other measures of sleep didn't change. Like the people didn't report better sleep quality overall. You know, if somebody falls asleep faster, but then they're up all night later, shortening sleep latency might not be clinically relevant. So that one is not it. Um, I did also find a January, 2023 paper by Arab in the show notes. It was also looking at human research from observational and randomized control trials. They found that there was an association between magnesium status and sleep quality according to observational studies, but the randomized control trials showed an uncertain association between magnesium supplementation and sleep disorders. Now, what's really interesting about this is it kind of goes back to our diet quality episode, suggesting that diet quality is more important than supplementation because they found this association between magnesium status and good quality sleep. Well, somebody's magnesium status could be high because they're eating lots of vitamins and minerals and tryptophan containing items with the whole food protein sources and the whole grains and all of that stuff that we dis- discussed. Yet when they go to the randomized controlled trials and they give someone, let's say, here's your magnesium pill and they find kind of inconclusive results, it makes sense because the context of the whole diet has not shifted. Um, and it actually reminds me, we did a podcast on magnesium, but it does remind me a bit of that too, where they weren't looking at sleep, but they were looking at um, just health risk and death risk. And basically they found that magnesium status in the diet reduced uh, health risk and yet supplementation did not, right? And so I think that might be at play here too with the magnesium um, showing this association. Um, It's the high quality of the diet where it's helping, but yet the supplementation probably isn't doing much. Hmm. Okay, next one in that sleep sack was apigenin. Uh, what is that and what does the science, what does the research say? Yeah, so this is another one that Huberman says helps people fall asleep. Um, what is apigenin? It's a phytochemical. So it's one of these thousands and thousands of compounds that we find in plants. We're still really learning what they all are, what they all do. Um, and apigenin is a derivative of chamomile and has kind of has that long history associated with kind of a calming effect. Maybe it triggers calming and relaxation. Of course, we'd want to actually see if we can reproduce that in um, some science and studies. I found a 2019 meta-analysis by Hugh in the show notes. Um, They did pull together research from 12 randomized controlled trials, but only one of those looked at chamomile and insomnia severity, and there was no effect of it. So not a lot of research there, and the research that we have is no effect. They did also happen to look at whether or not it affects sleep quality as measured by that uh, Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index and found that it improved somebody's score by less than one point. So, you know, it's kind of on the same scale of melatonin here. It's maybe statistically significant in terms of the numbers, but if somebody's moving from a 10.5 to a 10, I I think they still got a lot of sleep issues and that I wouldn't say that this is a strong recommendation that's really going to improve someone's sleep quality. So in my opinion, uh, we're, we're still 0 for 2 here on the recommendations in the sleep stack. Okay. We're going to keep, we're, we're hoping we're going to see where <laughs> we're, we got here. Might, uh, might turn it around here. Was, <laughs> yeah, it's not too late. Uh, theanine, 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 theanine. I think it's theanine. Yeah. Okay. Um, the most common form is in L theanine, just related to kind of its chemical structure. It's an amino acid that's primarily found in teas, like green, black, white, and oolong teas. 
Um, what's interesting is one serving of tea contains about 25 to 60 milligrams of L-theanine. And so Huberman recommends on the order of 100 to 400. So theoretically, somebody, a tea drinker, could could be getting there just with uh, natural consumption. And so L-theanine, it might affect sleep by influencing our neurotransmitters, primarily kind of calming brain activity, relaxing brain activity, um, quiet the mind, kind of so to speak. So what do we find in terms of the human research? We've got to remember that we're always looking for human research. Mice studies are interesting, but you don't want to take recommendations based on mice. <laughs> and that's where I don't find too much once we get to human research. There's a 2015 study by Rao in the show notes. It finds a small study um, with 22 men in Japan. They had their sleep efficiency increase and their wakefulness after sleep onset decrease. And so sleep efficiency, hey, now I'm sleeping for more of the hours in, that I spend in bed. And then the wakefulness after sleep onset, this is, okay, I'm not as awake after I wake up in the middle of the night, like as much, you know, that actually decreases. And so this again, at surface value, you'd be thinking, okay, see, see, this is the evidence that it works. But again, we always have to take that next step. Okay, how by how much? How much did my sleep efficiency sleep efficiency improved? Looks like about an improvement from 94% to 97% sleep efficiency. So if healthy is over 85, we're definitely in the weeds here of like, does this actually matter for these people, right? And then similarly, that wakefulness after sleep onset, it decreased them from 19 minutes to 12 minutes. Uh Okay, small study, not big changes, questionable whether or not this is really that indicative of the supplement improving sleep. Oh, and by the way, the study that they did in women showed no differences in those statistics or any other sleep quality. I did actually find also find a 2023 paper. Unfortunately, it's super small. It's nine women. Um, they looked at theanine and it did not improve their measure of sleep, sleep quality, which was the wakefulness after sleep onset compared to placebo. Interestingly enough, they did do kind of a side comparison where they also gave um, women some the caffeine and they found that the theanine was able to offset the caffeine consumption, which is cool, I guess, to know if you do that late, <laughs> late night coffee, you can then slam some theanine. But in the terms of just helping somebody fall asleep, that theanine was alone was not better than placebo. So I guess that's 0 for 3. All right, over three. Okay, uh, final final one then is the two grams of glycine and 100 milligrams of GABA, G-A-B-A, every third or fourth night. Maybe these are the really uh, effective ones. Maybe this is maybe this makes up for maybe all the Maybe this others. is where we turned it around. Uh, probably not, right? <laughs> EC held out <laughs> to the 150th episode to recommend a supplement. Oh, um, yeah, so why does he recommend glycine and GABA? both inhibitory neurotransmitters. So again, kind of that calming effect. Um, from what I understand, he says that these help his ability to get into a deep sleep. And But when he adds them every night, it sort of negates the rest of the sleep stack effectiveness. But he says that he doesn't really know why that would be the case. I think there's a good chance that all of this is very much a placebo effect. Um, you know, when I Try first up. Let me just say what glycine is. It's an amino acid. It's a non-essential amino acid, so we can make it on our own. But it's also found in things like meat and fish and dairy and legumes. And there was not a lot of human evidence. So I found there's a so paper in the show notes. There's about two studies that say it improves sleep quality. But when I go to look at them, their sample sizes of like 19 people, 11 people, and the experiments for like for three days maybe. I mean, it's really hard to make blatant chronic recommendations of like, take this every night, you know, just broadly to thousands and thousands of people, in my opinion. And then GABA, um, this is actually a, a non-proteinogenic amino acid. So we don't really use it in building proteins, but it's got a structure of an amino acid. It stands for gamma aminobutyric acid. And it also exists naturally in foods, um, tea, tomato, um, soybean have GABA in it. I feel like, you know, we've kind of been running through a lot of studies here. I'll save you the details. A 2020 review says, quote, there is very limited evidence for sleep benefits of oral GABA intake. And I haven't found anything more recent in terms of human research since that 2020 paper. So all of the sleep stack strikes out for me. I'm not going to recommend any of them. <laughs> okay. So in, in in reality, we didn't expect you to. So don't right. worry. You, didn't, you didn't shock us, EC. Okay. So it brings that up That wasn't like, a the surprise. Big... Wait, damn it. <laughs> 
<laughs> Sorry, I've, maybe maybe I've I've done this with you for too long to have right. to have expected anything ah, except shoot. that. Um, but it does bring like it's there's the one big question, and you mm. you just mentioned this uh, this concept, this idea of uh, of the placebo, and I, so I want to I want to I want to ask you about that, the value of the placebo in this particular case. But I think I would also add to it maybe the further complexity in this particular case. Because what I think he's offering is people, he's offering to people a routine that they then believe is going to help them sleep better. And so because this is sleep related, I, I think it's particularly um, complex is not the right word, but like, I think it's, it's complicated in the sense of like, okay, somebody I admire, somebody I listen to, somebody who I trust says, do this thing, it will improve. I start doing this thing and the routine itself begins to introduce this, if it's a placebo, whatever, it begins to introduce it. And then I do that every night. I do it every night. And suddenly I'm in this position where I think I'm sleeping better than I did before I started using the sleep stack. But it's so complicated as to what is, to your point, what is actually manufacturing the belief that I've slept better, right back to the, the sort of the self-reported analysis the day after. It's like, well, which one is it? Which one was it? If you took away the sleep stack but kept the entire rest of the routine, does it change? And if it changes, is it only because you now believe that the routine isn't as effective, right? So it's so hard. So anyways, all of that to say, like just talk to me a little bit about placebo and maybe specifically the placebo around like this idea of the sleep stack. Yeah, I mean, I kind of thought about it well, kind of, I did think about it multiple times while researching sleep supplements, because I'm very much of the opinion that if you get a placebo effect from a supplement as it relates to getting better sleep, oh man, I'm all in because the placebo effect of more sleep is great. I mean, we'll take it. We'll take the placebo effect anytime we get it, right? It's, it's so awesome that we could potentially just trick our mind into thinking, that this is the reason that I'm now sleeping. I think the problem I have, and very much could be actually Huberman's response as well. He could have read some studies that I either don't see, or maybe they're more in animal studies or whatever it is, and he believes that they do, and so therefore they work. And so he could be just experiencing the placebo effect, and therefore it has value for him. And I totally understand that. Um, I think for me, the line is, okay, to then make broad recommendations from others I really have to have the evidence for that because what if that's what your doctor did? What if your doctor had knowing evidence that something didn't work in terms of, let's say, a cancer therapy? And I appreciate that this is not as quite as serious, but something had knowing evidence of something that did not work, but told you to believe in something because he wanted you to heal. I mean, it's sort of the same thing, although I appreciate the outcomes aren't always quite as severe. But that's what the problem is. If the evidence is not there, even though it could work because of the placebo effect from a, you know, from a recommending point of view, you have to have the evidence that something works. You have to align your opinion with what the evidence that you have is, right? You can't just hope that because people have confidence in me that some may experience the placebo effect. And so I, I think that's important for people to um here and that, okay, maybe this stuff is quote worth a shot. Maybe the taking of some sugar pill helps you to go to sleep at night. But I would also love it to not be tied to kind of, okay, you have to go spend X hundred dollars on supplements every month. And that, oh, if it doesn't work, be very ready to stop using them because it very well could not work. And potentially also remind people, and this might not be human because I don't know if those supplements are NSF or USP, but we also have to go back to some of that other stuff I rec said that like the doses are all over the place with supplements, a lot of different brands, and there's also contamination of the stuff. There is actually potentially some risk involved as well besides just, oh, let's hope for the placebo effect. Got it. Okay. Uh, in our previous conversation about diet and sleep, we hit on sleep hygiene. We just hit on some of the best practices that... Um, uh, absent supplementation that we can do to to improve our sleep quality and our quantity. It might make sense to revisit them to the degree that it, you feel like it's worthwhile. Yeah, I mean, after a litany of, hey, don't use these supplements, <laughs> people might be left with, come on, easy. <laughs> let's, let's give us some stuff to do. And we did. We talked about some of those basic diet and lifestyle practices. Um, I really liked this list. It's actually a list of 14 things. It's from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. So this is this group of physicians and scientists and other healthcare practitioners that are all giving these sleep recommendations. They're the ones who really don't recommend melatonin. They don't really recommend any supplements. I mean, I went to their 
store on their website. There was no supplements there to be found. But anyway, there's this... Just t-shirts? T-shirt, yeah. If you want to go get a t-shirt for the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, they've got it. Um, But so they have this sleep, and it was especially on the page related to kind of how to improve short-term insomnia. And I just want to kind of go through it because I thought it was a nice bullet point list. Number one, keep a consistent sleep schedule. Get up at the same time every day, even on weekends and during vacations. Two, set a bedtime that is early enough for you to get at least seven hours of sleep. Three, don't go to bed unless you are sleepy. Four, if you don't fall asleep after 20 minutes, get out of bed. Five, establish a relaxing bedtime routine. Six, use your bed only for sleep and sex. Seven, make your bedroom quiet and relaxing. Keep the room at a comfortable, cool temperature. Eight, limit exposure to bright light in the evenings. Nine, turn off electronic devices at least 30 minutes before bedtime. 10, don't eat large, don't eat a large meal before bedtime. If you're hungry at night, eat a light, healthy snack. 11, exercise regularly and maintain a healthy diet. 12, avoid consuming caffeine in the late afternoon or evening. 13, avoid consuming alcohol before bedtime. And 14, reduce your fluid intake before bedtime. And, you know, that, that, was a lot. Uh, I think it's easy to understand why people are like, come on, you see, just tell me a supplement, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all of these things, I love how, you know, exercise regularly, maintain a healthy diet was just slipped in there as one of the 14 bullet points. <laughs> and yet, you know, it's something that a lot of us really struggle to do consistently, right? And so I think this list is just really valuable. It's like, tell me that you've really done all of these things. You really check the box on the sleep hygiene before you try to go into maybe I'll get the placebo effect from L-theanine, right? You know, give it a real shot for four weeks to get up, to get your system and your schedule in place and to do all of these things. And then tell me, you know, that sleep didn't improve. I think overwhelming percent of people are going to see a massive improvement in sleep by adhering to these. And I know that was a lot. So uh, in the email list um, or in my email that I'll send out with it, this podcast, I'm going to include kind of this checklist. So if you're not on that that's uh, optimizemenutrition.com slash email. Okay, so my nightly routine of sitting in bed, watching Netflix, <laughs> eating a pint of ice cream, and drinking a vodka and Coke. Not? Not? Are you telling me that this is negatively affecting my sleep? Because I was also taking quite a bit of su- supplementation. Right. Yeah, the eyeballs to, to glued to the scrolling things. of the, the phone right before you go to sleep. Might you know, watching all the TikToks might, might not be it. Might not be the uh, watching all <laughs> the, I watched all of TikTok the other night, the whole of it. Oh, dear. It took a while, but I got through it. I was going to say, uh, that's it. <laughs> okay, see, thank you. That was great. Uh, we are going to jump into a quick bite in just a moment. But first, I wanted to ask you, if you're enjoying this show, if you enjoy this episode, please do share it with a friend. It is the single best way that you can help us continue to go and grow and continue to get this message out that all you really need is fruits and vegetables and to move your body. And that's the, <laughs> that's the beginning and the end of it. So thank you in advance for sharing it with a friend or a cousin or a colleague. Okay, quick bite is when we take a listener question and we just give you a kind of five or 10 minutes to, uh, to answer it. We've got one this week from Ashley. This is what she sent over. I wanted to get your input on how I communicate nutrition with my girls who are three and six years old because quote unquote calories is such a loaded term. I've started talking to my girls about how each food gives us, gives us different amounts of energy to get through the day. There's sustaining energy where, uh, when we eat food high in protein or fat, there is quick energy when we eat food high in carbohydrates like fruit or crackers. There can be dense energy when we consume food that is high in energy, but doesn't have much actual substance like cake, candy, ice cream, etc. And there is food that provides optimal energy that gives you uh, gives you what you need and may make you feel more full like fruit, vegetables, oatmeal, etc. When we consume more energy than our body needs, we store it for later use. And oftentimes we never actually use it later. This is why we make choices that provide optimal energy for us. We eat, uh, we can eat dense energy and enjoy it, but realize that we may feel hungry later and don't need any more energy. Or at that point, reach for food that provides more optimal energy like fruits or vegetables. I would love your thoughts on this approach. Yeah, I think there's a lot of good pieces in there. I do like the focus not on calories and weight, but just on the idea of energy. Um, I think that's great, you know, especially if they're involved. It, well, it doesn't even have to be sports. I was going to think sports is an easy one, right? Like you have energy to run around the soccer field or whatever it is they like to do. But you could even be, you know, 
maybe they're not sports inclined, but music inclined. It's give you the energy to stay really focused or something like that. So I think the energy is a really good one. And it is true to to the actual science as well. So it's not like this is just some sort of lie. Um, I think where I would probably go though, instead of kind of the, the quick energy idea or the long lasting energy, I forget the term that she used, as well as kind of the storing of energy, I think I would then lean more heavily on the health impacts. And I would do things like, oh, in these foods, we get more vitamins and minerals. And this is really good for strong bones. And this is really good for our immune system. And this is really good for skin and nails and hair and all of these other things, right? Um, That would be one way I would go with the health um, elements. And what's also often forgotten related to energy is that we need the vitamins and minerals in the production of energy. So when we eat things that are, let's say, more of the processed foods, we won't get as many of the vitamins and minerals that we need to create energy. And so you can also make the discussion of, okay, we need to produce energy and we need a good balance of, you can say carbs or fat, and vitamins and minerals. And some of our foods have a really high balance of carbs and fat and not a lot of vitamins and minerals. And other ones have lots of vitamins and minerals and not a lot of carbs and fat. And so we need a good, we need a a mixture of them, right? We need (laughs) a good amount of the whole foods and not as many of the processed foods. I would go that way as opposed to talking about the storing of energy and the quick energy. The quick energy thing, it's kind of just a misnomer. It's not really how our bodies work. And I think it continues to perpetuate how people think about food in the sense of, you know, we don't necessarily have these really problematic um, issues from eating something that's a higher glycemic food. And instead we want to talk about like the whole quantity and the whole diet. And that's really why I don't like going down kind of the quick energy route and instead focusing on, okay, what does the whole diet look like? And the whole diet needs to include those vitamins and minerals to help us with energy production and all of the other stuff. Good eyesight, good skin, hail and nails, good immune system, blah, blah, blah. Uh, well, <clears throat> the one thing I was thinking about when looking at that question is, you know, she, she started it off with this idea of like, I don't want to talk about calories. And yet so often with our conversations, like we have to eventually get back to talking about calories. Like, and so, and I get, I get that there's this sort of like social whatever around calories and there's the stigma of them. And, but I'm just curious, it's maybe specifically talk, thinking about kids and how Ashley could perhaps, you know, evolve how she talks about these, these things as her kids get older, like where, how, like where, how do you have the honest conversation about calories without demonizing them without overcomplicating it. Like it's like, it's one of those things, like at some point you should be probably talking about calories. Yeah, that's a great or not, question. Or not, you tell me if not. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think high school can handle the conversation. I think it, it might even be the best time for it. I have to guess that most parents are allowing their high schoolers use cell phones with TikTok and Instagram and whatever else models on there. So it could be the perfect intervention to be like, okay, so we also have this issue where bodies represented in the media are not normal, not necessary for health. And let's talk about what a healthy body size could be. And I know we've talked about that here a few times, but just for a quick reference, um, the body fats associated with health for women are 20 to 30% and for men are 12 to 20%. Um, which are certainly more body fat than what we see on the cover of Muscle and Fitness magazine. And to actually show those kind of bodies, sizes, stuff like that. Um, And to then explain that calories are part of achieving that kind of healthy body fat range. Um, I think that's a good time to do it. Of course, depending on the readiness of the individual. And of course, if there's other issues surrounding them that that might be better handled by somebody else um, besides necessarily the parent. But yeah, I think high school is of the age to, and why not, right? If they're going to start heading out to on their own world um, on their own, better, better to get some education at home before just kind of left to their devices of diet culture and everything else that comes with that. Left their, their own devices on their devices. Yeah, quite literally. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Anything else to Ashley, uh, this idea of, um, kind of energy versus calories, uh, worth mentioning before we wrap up. Yeah. I have some parents who, uh, especially something in like my master class where they're recording food and there's a little bit of nervousness surrounding, you know, paying attention to your diet and then your, your children might be asking, what are you doing? And I think just to kind of reiterate that, that you can 
also promote that I'm looking for the same balance of energy that you just discussed. And I want to make sure I'm not just getting the right, you know, carbs, fat, and protein. I'm also getting the right micronutrients. And so I'm trying to figure out that right balance for me versus again, always being like, I'm just losing weight or whatever the aesthetic um, picture might be. Got it. All right. Thank you, EC. What's the best way to get in, uh, get a question into the queue for a future quick bite when we, when we squeeze another one in? What's yeah. the easiest, best, fastest way? Click reply to any email I send out and you have to be on my email list, optimizemenutrition.com slash email to do that. And thanks everybody in advance for sending those questions. I love them. I love including them. So thank you, EC. And I will be back next week for another episode of the Consistency Project Podcast.